Hello and good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the much anticipated lecture on church history 101. And you should be able to understand that obviously from the year zero, it's just considered, well, there's no year zero, it technically starts on the year one. Uh, we have the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, right now, of course, we are in the year 2021. And we are still counting the days unto his return. And so within this 2,000 year period approximately, we have in approximately the year 1,000, let's say you could have, let's call it the Crusades or the height of them approximately. Also the schism between East and West approximately. And between that period you have 1492 where you have Columbus discovers the new world or raids a continent full of people, depending on the way you look at it. And so, um, and um, whatever way you look at it, the discovery of the New World was probably the most momentous event in human history, history being what we have recorded so far. And um, meanwhile, you have around the year 300 BC, you have Socrates, um, you could either say B.C. or B.C.E. And that is another important lecture if you are going into history, of course, is that A.D. is ahead in time after our Lord, which is Anno Domino, which means the year of our Lord. Or nowadays, because not everyone is Christian, we also use the Common Era. And then what that allows us to do is B.C.E. becomes before Common Era era and around the year 30 um, CE uh, BCE actually you have the assassination of Julius Caesar so this should somewhat orient you the rise of Egypt you could say is around 6,000 BCE before the common era um Actually, this is obviously not the scale because you have 2,000 down here and 6,000 here. But uh, you have slowly man coming from the uh, Bronze Age to, you know, Iron Age, Copper, to the Bronze Age and the Copper Age. Uh, and then, so Judaism probably starts right around here, 5,700 years. We don't know where to pin the Exodus, but it's somewhere between here and here. Um... And But what we'll be focusing on, because obviously this is a thing on church history, is approximately, let's say, so our Lord was crucified in the year 33 AD. And so he gave his apostles a great commission, which is go spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth. And from then on, we will be discussing, let's say, up to the Council of Nicaea, but possibly the Crusades. But... um. You could say the Council of Nicaea is around the year 333 CE, which is when uh, the divinity of our Lord was decided. And then another event would be the rise of Islam, which would be around, let's say, um, let's say he was born in 590, he died in 632 CE, which is the rise of Islam. And then actually we're going to go up to the Great Schism, most likely. So in 1053, I don't know, I may just do the whole lecture in one thing, AD, which is the schism between the Orthodox Church um, and the Catholic. Um, and it has not healed today. Those two churches are still not in communion. And then later on, we might discuss the Protestant era. But this is the approximate period ooh, of this lecture. Pardon me. And before, I had traced out some things. So we won't be tracing it, it out as much because I had managed to use a world map. And with this in mind, we should still keep that in our hindsight. So obviously... Here, I can fold that a bit. So obviously we know that this is the Mediterranean in the Middle East. And so uh, the Roman Empire lasted. 
and oh i'm sorry so in this thing also we should kind of consider in this world map the year 410 uh or so is considered when the sack of rome happens is considered the collapse of the roman empire so you had the byzantine empire uh lead the torch of christianity for much of this period so before this uh was the you'd say was the western roman empire we're going to get into this and then after this it becomes more about the eastern roman empire and the eastern church and its legacy so uh and of course we still have the western church today which is catholic or lutheran now there's going to be some kind of skewing towards catholicism in here just because early church history kind of records them um they have a lot of material on it and they're also usually usually the ones obsessing it now we know of course that jerusalem is about right here and this is and our lord was from bethlehem and he preached around this area there is a jordan river and then there's a sea of galilee so he was preaching in northern and so there was a church in jerusalem now we have the modern political territories kind of drawn onto this map but we are going to ignore that we are still in the ancient world so this is the roman empire this is spain france that's italy that's greece that's modern day turkey but it would have been called anatolia or asia minor that's britain ireland northern ireland finland this is africa so that's egypt today there's an uh a suez canal going between this area it facilitates world trade. Obviously, it is not existing in the British dug it in around the 1800s. This is the Nile River, and these two are the Euphrates and Tigris Rivers. Um, the Nile River flows out into a delta, and it's a city called Alexandria. And it was an ancient city from Alexander's time. Again, Alexander was about the year 300 or so, so CE, um, BCE, before Christ. And so um, he comes out of Macedonia and he conquers this uh, massive empire that goes out into India over here. Over here is West Africa. So this is Egypt, modern day. Uh, this is Algeria. So this is Libya. And that is Tunisia and Morocco, Spain, Portugal, um, Mauritania, Mali, and Chad, I think. So... Um, what you have is that this area was all Christian, and this area was all Christian. This is Europe, which is also all Christian, so at some point. And um, this is the early church by the year 300. So the second city of learning was Alexandria. And it, it not only did it have a large Jewish population, but it also had a Hellenistic population. They were the first to translate the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, specifically the Tanakh. And it's called the Septuagint because 70 Jewish scholars uh, were the ones who translated it into Greek, and they were considered um, authoritative enough that it was a legitimate translation that the world of Judaism accepted. But quickly, that became the second holy see of Christianity. But we are kind of going ahead of ourselves again. Let's keep our uh, map in sight. Um, so you have uh, our Lord. And so what, what I was discussing before was called a Great Commission. And so we have a King James Bible. And so that's the one Protestants seem to kind of prefer. So it says that, um, and when Christ came into the coast of Caesarea, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I am the Son of Man? I am. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And, oops. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that should tell no man that he was the Christ. So, Using this verse, I'll let that ink dry a little bit so it doesn't smudge the next page. But that was accidental. Um, I've had people tell me that you should not mark the Bible. So I don't mean to offend anyone's sensibilities. And again, like I said, this might follow the Catholic version for a minute over here. So uh, we will quickly go into the Protestant one. You can tell me if I'm fair. So uh, there were five holy sees. There was another one called Antioch. And that's a city that kind of no longer exists, but you could consider it kind of... Um, Aleppo in Syria and Antioch 
is um, was one of the holy sees. But quickly, because the apostles, two of them, so Rome is about here. And like I said, this is Italy because it looks like a boot. I think I forgot to draw Sardinia and Sicily, so shame on me. But um, you can see when I was doing sketches before that, I kind of did did go into it. But anyway, um, the uh, because Rome was an imperial capital, all roads lead to Rome. But you also have the Apostle Paul, and let me go into kind of a red pen over here. So you also have the Apostle Paul. What he was doing was he was converted on the road to Damascus, which is here. So he was going up to Damascus to persecute, and he goes back to Jerusalem to convert. And so you have the Apostle Paul. He goes from basically hopping along all these cities. So when he's writing to Ephesus, when he's writing to Coloss for Colossians, and when he's writing to Galatia for Galatians, um, I don't know how to spell it. But, uh, and then what else is the other city? Um, Corinthians, Corinth also. So uh, when he's writing to all these cities, they are kind of over here in Asia Minor. And he's skipping and making trips. And he's also writing about how he wants to go to Spain in one of his epistles. So he wants to continue his journey, but he's martyred, unfortunately, in Rome. And St. Peter also goes there. But these are all, they kind of go under Antioch. But the original New Testament letters that we have, they kind of are all towards Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey today, but that's um, Anatolia also. And so you have Greece over here, like I said, and this is former Yugoslavia. I didn't want to draw all the things. That's Germany. Um, sorry, that's Germany. That's Poland. That's Netherlands, France, UK, as I said, Switzerland, and so Denmark, Sweden. And so you have, um, you know, one of the early church fathers was in Lyon, which is like in uh, France. But so you have the early church kind of growing along over here. And what you quickly go into is that uh, another Holy See kind of develops because, again, Rome was the imperial capital. They used to have a thing that all roads lead to Rome. So because it was imperial by land and by route, the easiest way to get anywhere. And so there was also the city called like Car Carthage, but there were also the Berbers. I think St. Augustine was one. Um, but this whole area was also kind of Christian, and Alexandria kind of represented them. But um, actually, so my, my uh, Catholic friend actually taught me that when they introduced the Latin Mass, it was brought in over from North Africa. Because, again, this was the intellectual capital because they had all the Hel Hellenistic learning. And that he got to Rome. So the idea of a, the Mass was originally, you know, in Greek. And so, and the, the form of it was borrowed from North Africa. So, again, it was a very thriving kind of different world, the Mediterranean, how it looked back then. Um, who was it? Who was the Bishop of Lyon? It was Irenaeus. And that's why he was never declared a saint. Um... Uh, but he was, let's say, Bishop of Leon. But we are kind of, so the the point of, of kind of overviewing this history is that the, the Catholic kind of understanding is, is that when our Lord, before he was crucified, he gave us, you know, he gave his authority um, to the apostles, right? And how many apostles were there? And everyone knows that there were 12 apostles. So... What the, he laid hands on the apostles, and then what those apostles did was they laid hands on bishops. And there are also evangelists, like Timothy was an evangelist, and um, but there were others who were bishops. And so um, what they did was that formed the early church. And that's who met at Nicaea to codify the Trinity. So the authority of the church, the history of the church, kind of goes along from that. So again, we have the Great Commission. And so what we then have is, um, this is the, the, the image of the early church. Again, North Africa. Africa is very much a part of the story. Even uh, Lyon, as you see, in France. Because it's it, the, the faith spread so far. These were all uh, thriving early Christian communities. And so... Um, you even had the uh, communities over here, and so Islam kind of comes out uh, down from here. But I don't know if we're going to get into that just yet. So that's when you had this early period. It was persecuted. Diocletian is the first one. So at first, Constantine is the one who uh, legalizes Christianity. But then after that, it becomes the official Theodosius makes the um, uh, 
it, first you have to stop the persecution, then you legalize it, then you, it becomes the official. So that's done by St. Constantine in the Orthodox and Catholic churches. And so, but then it becomes the official religion later under, I believe, Theodosius. It's a great name too. So it's easy to, easy to remember. And so um, you have, you go from a persecuted church to an official church. And then that's, again, why you have the city of Constantinople, which becomes the other holy see. And so these are the five holy sees. They are mentioned in the church, the first seven ecumenical councils that they're going to be in this, excuse me, they're going to be in this order, which is Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. And so the, actually, so the original, the Coptic church today, even, you know, the, the majority of Christians in Egypt, they belong to this uh, Alexandrian um, Orthodox Church. The Oriental Orthodox are different from the main of Orthodoxy, which is Russia, Serbia, and Greece, especially Constantinople, Armenia, uh, Serbia, again, today. So, and obviously, today we have a weird situation where the Patriarch of Moscow is more important. Let's say Moscow is here. You know, I always think that, and this is kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but we'll see later other patriarchs that become very powerful are moscow and the other is the archbishop of canterbury in england but we that's much 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 later we have to get to why these two become important of course germany has the lutheran reformation so um but the, we are still in the early 300s and this is this part which is now uh so eventually rome collapses and then the eastern part of the roman empire becomes more important and i kind of drew this over here so i don't want to draw it again but it's pretty important how i um kind of split it up because again this is again this is why i chose a nicer tracer but this is europe middle east africa uh, and what happens is that, like I said, this all area is Greek speaking Christianity, uh, even including up to here and probably even up to here. And the Latin church is actually up there. And so, um, they had a very different idea of what it means to have a Pope. And so you always had, again, you had something called the council of Ephesus. And then there was a robber council at the same time. And I don't really understand all that part of church history. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But you clearly see in the geography, and this is where many of these splits and schisms between Eastern and Western happen, was that because one half of the empire spoke Greek and the other half of the empire spoke Latin, you kind of had a lot of different ideas, especially things were lost in translation. You could kind of consider it. And so, but this was the Greek church. You know, before the rise of Islam, of course. But so there is a whole, and again, they could also argue that they were the early church and they were the original church because, th again, the religion rose from here. Apostles Peter and Paul did arrive there, that these were the imperial capitals, but these holy sees were marginalized over time and these became the imperial uh, importance. But again, so you, when you had a lot of these divisions that we're going to discuss between East and West, is really between the Greek church and the Latin church. And one of the accusations, actually, that the Greeks make against the Latin church or the Western church or the Roman church is that it is um, very dogmatic and it, its understanding of things is inherently um, trying to define things. For example, they believe in the uh, holy presence in the Eucharist, but they don't try to define it with words like substantiation or not using words like substantiation. So in the early periods, you have as much influence going on here as you have going on there. Where's my fancy pen? And so there's not much to... Um, and so again, like I said, when you went from a persecuted church to a regular church, around the year 300 AD, you had a bishop in Alexandria teaching what was called a heresy. And that heresy was that Christ was the created being and that he was, you know, he could have been God. But the thing was, though, he was the first created being and therefore he wasn't eternal with the Father. And therefore at Nicaea, which is again over here, and actually nobody knows or thinks about this today. I think Ephesus is over here. So again, there's so many important sites all over the early Mediterranean that are important to the church. And, you know, obviously the focus later becomes Rome and Constantinople. But there's there's a lot of there's a lot going on in the whole empire and outside the empire. And you know, even out here and here and in the pagan, you know, and throughout history. So we shouldn't um we shouldn't uh 
we should try to not simplify history. So, what was I doing? Uh, eventually they meet at Nicaea. And this was decided because that heretical bishop was teaching um, that Christ was the first created being and therefore he was not eternal with the Father. And, and again, like I said, it comes down to apostolic authority because Christ gave the power to the bishops and then the bishops gave power to the apostles. Sorry, Christ gave power to the apostles. The apostles gave authority. Apostle, just by the way, just means sent forth. I'm on a mission. And bishop just means overseer. So it's not even... Anyway, and so priests came much later. They were presbyters. But... Um, they were sent forth by our Lord. And then you have the apostles. And then you have the bishops. And so, um, all the bishops, it's kind of understood from the early church in that way. That whatever the bishops decide becomes the dogma. And anyone who goes against what the bishops, because the bishops couldn't be wrong, because again, they're getting their power directly from the apostles who get their power from Christ. Who obviously is God, comes from God was the greatest prophet and came from God and um, the son and second person of the Holy Trinity. So, uh, you, but you're going to have a schism very, very soon between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. And basically, if you could draw a line, it would be something like that, um, where that breaks off and that breaks off. And so let's go into that a little bit more, but they decide certain things about the Trinity. But after deciding certain things about the Trinity, um, the Western Empire becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. At some point, the Goths, who are not yet Christians, are attacking Rome. The barbarian tribes are attacking Rome. So Rome is sacked by 410, as, I'm, as I wrote here. And then you have the rise. Um, and so you have this period of, like, nothing going on. But again, Constantinople is reigning supreme. So it's not nothing, but it's just, like, Rome is kind of a mess. You know, nothing's going on, and so all the action's kind of going over here. So, let's see. Can I do something? So, finally, you know, what you have finally is um, Islam. And what, around the year 610, is the rise of Islam um, from Mecca. And the first thing they take is the Holy See of Jerusalem, um, about the year 720. And then they quickly take Alexandria. Um, and then it takes them... Not far on to take Damascus. And it actually, so it takes a couple of 700 more years to actually take the city of Constantinople. But what happens is, is eventually in the year 1452, 1432, it takes them a, quite a long time, but they eventually take Constantinople. So four out of five of these holy sees are taken over by Islam. Um, starting, but within a century also, this area goes from becoming mainly Christian and also very heterodox. Like, for example, there were the Donatists down here, and what they believed was that the bishops or the priest that was administering the sacraments had to be pure. And if your priest wasn't, like, personally morally pure and you couldn't, like, test him and observe him, then you couldn't receive his sacraments. And what the church decided, I think St. Cyprian or who else not, kind of decided was like, no, you're in heresy. So, but eventually these areas fall under the rule of Islam. And um, Constantinople is last because it's a walled city, but they quickly take Anatolia. And again, this is historical Christian heartland. And what happens is um, this is uh, very troubling to the rest of the empire that's watching. Again, Constantinople holds out. These areas remain Greek Orthodox. Let's cover this. So it kind of remains, I mean, even in the modern world today, these are kind of, well, there's Croatia, which is Catholic. So please don't jump on me, my Croatian friends. But these kind of remain Orthodox areas. Certainly, Russia is kind of like the largest or Orthodox country today. But there's also Armenia, which I believe is here. It was the first country to become Christian. But um, So you have a lot of Orthodoxy hanging out over here. Um, and they kind of defend. This is the Black Sea, so it's a body of water. Let me try to... I don't know if blue would help. But... Um, no, they were cheating. But the, okay, so that's the Black Sea, and that's the uh, Caspian Sea. So um, there is an interesting conflict uh, between Islam, like between idols. Now, finally, the schism between Orthodoxy. I think this is the last thing. My phone is also telling me that the battery is dying. Is that? Should I look it up? So the thing is that in in John, 
um, the Gospel of John, Christ promises us that he will send the Comforter, right? And so the Comforter has many different translations. Um, it can be, well, it's clearly understood in Christianity to be the Holy um, Spirit. And the thing is, though, is it sent from Christ or is it sent from the Father? And so that's kind of a debate that comes out between Christianity. And there's many things like who has a right to appoint the Bishop of Constantinople, the the Bishop of Rome, who's the Bishop of Bishops, or is it the Emperor in Constantinople who's going to appoint the Bishop of Constantinople? That's a conflict between early Christianity. Again, Islam is also interfering with all this. They have like a perfidious heresy. Um, now, when Christ says he's going to send the Comforter, another word for that is, of course, Paraclete. Another word for that is um, advocate, and um, so it's that's the original Greek word. So now, the Latin Church, you know, the Catholic position was that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. They both proceed, like give life to the Holy Spirit. And the orthodox position was that the Father, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds um, from them. And so what you finally have is a schism. So in the year 1054, this is our roadmap, what you have is in Constantinople, you have the Bishop of Rome was there and the Bishop of Constantinople. They were meeting and they had a disagreement and one says you're excommunicated and the Bishop of Constantinople says no, you're excommunicated and they both excommunicate each other and ever since then they don't take each other's communion, generally speaking. Uh, the Catholic Church says that it's valid but not licit. Um, so you have, uh, but if you're dying, I guess you could take it. So uh, you have this... Um, break like i said between east and west and i colored it with pencil before but this was the greek speaking part and this was the latin speaking part so they already were not getting along but they finally break communion with each other and they say that well you know you don't have the right understanding of christianity and we don't want to break up with you. We don't want to cause a schism in the body of Christ. This is the Orthodox position. But you're in error. You're in heresy. You're, so therefore, schism is allowed when you're in heresy. So these kind of became, and like I said, Alexandria is the Coptic Church, which kind of is separate anyway from the mainstream Orthodox. But they kind of just said, like, well, we don't need a pope. All the bishops are equal. And Catholicism just went on to rule most of Europe. And it said from Rome, that's where all the power will be. And so, um, once you have that great schism, again, you know, thirty, the year 33, our Lord gives us the Great Commission. The Council of Nicaea recognizes the divinity of Christ. The collapse of Rome gives power to the Eastern Roman Empire, based in Constantinople, which is Istanbul today. But this becomes the dominant power instead of Rome. And then the rise of Islam kind of weakens Constantinople. The schism of orthodoxy causes a division in the church or the body of Christ. And um, we have this unfortunate situation. Now we can kind of go into the Crusades. The Crusades are when Christianity kind of, um, the empire strikes back, right? So whatever you have, uh, you have the Western church kind of, Pope uh, Urban II calls for a crusade. And it's mostly French um so again, we're going past the year 1000 now, okay? Before, it was not the year 1000, and now it kind of is the year 1000. Well, here, so let me just... Should I, should I, how do I do this? Um, so we have is... You have England. And you have France. Which become... Like, there's too many people, and there's a lot of, like, bickering going on between... England and France and all the European country. Pope Urban II declares in his call for a crusade that there's too many of you and it's necessary that many among you perish for resources. And England and France basically, they provide the manpower for the Pope's war. France is also trying to solidify its power and become like papal 
controller, basically papal successor. And so they lead the assault to retake Jerusalem. And so the thing is, though, if you've ever played, I know some of you are going to notice the Crusader Kings reference, but if you ever play that game Crusader Kings, and this is why I think it's funny, but it's like your empire, your kingdom is so busy trying to uh, stay together. Like your, your own feudal lords, if you're playing England, your feudal lords in Scotland are fighting between each other. So, you know, it's not a good idea to send so many of your forces down to, you know, Egypt and Jerusalem to retake the Holy Land. Uh, but this is around the year 1000 again. So we're now going, so around the year, um, okay. So around the year 1100, the, the, the Jerusalem is lost 1190 or no 1190 is when Jerusalem is retaken by Saladin. So around the year 1190 though, is when you have the, the peak of the crusades, uh, again, CE or AD. And, um, what you have is this failed attempt to create some crusader kingdoms. But meanwhile, what happens is Europe, which was in isolation since the collapse of Rome, they become very cultured through Islamic learning. And Islamic learning picks up the Greek learning that they get from the collapse of Ro uh, Byzantium. By the way, uh, Constantinople is also known as the Byzantine Empire because the city used to be known as Byzantium and Byzantine Empire. Greco-Roman Empire is actually like the official name scholars use for it now. Because see, it was the Roman Empire. It was just the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So... You have the Crusades, which is basically them trying to get Jerusalem again. And obviously Jerusalem is in uh, Muslim hands for several hundred years until uh, Israel founded in 1948, which is the 20th century. And uh, 1967 is the Six-Day War when it's recaptured by Israeli forces or uh, under occupation. But the Waqaf, of course, is under Jordanian rule. So this is the history of the church, part one. Hopefully... Um, I didn't miss anything. The bishops are the successors of the apostles, and this is how the church was governing. Finally, they split over the phylloque, more or less. They split over a lot of things. And finally, you have Islam, which changes the map altogether. And you have Europe and Latin Christianity become the thing until the Reformation, which we will probably get into next time. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, God bless you. Have a good day. Feel free to leave comments down below.